Distinguished speakers, uh, dear participants, um, welcome and, and thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Nadim Ahmed, the Deputy Director of the Centre for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. And I'm delighted to have with us today Dr. Richard Florida and Dr. Andres Rodriguez Bossi for today's dialogue on getting creative about regional development. Uh, our second dialogue on the future of regions following an excellent first session with Dr. Parag Kana a few months ago. Uh, there we looked at new patterns of human mobility in the face of rapid climate change and other forces and their implications for regions, in particular, um, what regions are and can be doing to better attract talent. Today, uh, we take a, a step further in that direction and explore the critical importance of talent in shaping more diverse, innovative, and ultimately more creative places. And in particular, what regions can do and what levers are available to be more attractive to creative talent and also investors. And to help us get there, we're very lucky to have with us Dr. Florida, perhaps best known for his book, The Rise of the Creative Class, a, a seminal piece that's had a profound impact on urban and regional development policy in the US, Canada, and, and indeed beyond. We're also very lucky to have with us Dr. Rodriguez Posse of the London School of Economics, an internationally renowned expert in economic geography and regional science, who will animate the discussion after Dr. Florida's keynote speech before opening the floor to all of you here today for a 30 minute Q&A session using the Q&A function on Zoom. And I hope that everybody is now, I think after two years, very familiar with how we can, we can use that. Um, now, today we're going to look at creativity through a broad prism, um, but I wanted to take the opportunity of flagging some of our recent work within the, 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 the CFE that looks at a more targeted group of cultural and creative workers. And in particular, encourage you to take a close look at our recent report, The Culture Fix, Creative People, Places and Industries. And, and that report demonstrated the critical importance of culture and creativity for jobs, growth, and indeed well-being. And in particular, their potential to drive innovation across the economy and indeed regional attractiveness. And perhaps a, a, a key statistic there, for example, just to illustrate the importance of, you know, even with our more targeted notion, we're still talking about one in 10 jobs in cities like Berlin, and Prague, and hopefully you'll see coming up on the on the chat um, a link to to the work, and perhaps also the video um, that underpins that work. Now, as I said, that work points very clearly to the huge potential that can accrue to places from attracting creative talent, and and that is very much the focus of today's dialogue. The dialogue has been informed, and indeed, I really hope we'll be able to also inform our work on rethinking regional attractiveness in the new global environment. The work that explores the economic and non-economic drivers of talent, investment, and visitor attraction across OECD regions. And indeed, whilst economic opportunities are fundamental, um, so too are those regional assets that increase resident well-being, like access to an intact natural environment, a strong sense of community, quality internet, infrastructure, sound public institutions, accessible public transport, and of course, last but by no means least, talent. Um, now, I'm going to perhaps paraphrase here, and I'm sure that Dr. Florida will correct me if I'm wrong, um, but Dr. Florida brings these critical assets or perhaps magnets together and, under a trinity of T's, the quality and quantity of talent, technology, and tolerance. And, and drawing on his excellent work, looking at how cities can leverage on these three T's, we're gonna have the privilege now of hearing how non-metro and rural areas can do the same, including through harnessing innovation spillovers from nearby cities. So without further ado, my great pleasure to say, Dr. Florida, the floor is yours, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Nadim. Uh, thank you to your colleagues, Peter, Michael, and Claire. And thank you to my dear friend and colleague, Andres, and all the team who put this together and everyone listening in. Um, that was a wonderful introduction um, and, and really helped set the stage. And as I noted in the chat, and I'm not sure everyone can see it, that report that you mentioned is so resonant um, with what I'm going to talk about and my own research. So I think we see stuff in a, things in a very aligned manner. Um, and then we can take questions. You know, Andres will have questions, but also I think all of you can probably write in questions. And, and I would encourage you to be tough on me. You know, one of the things you learn when you move from an academic to a public intellectual is that questioning, um, not only from academic colleagues, but from the media, from professionals can be quite tough. And I think, I think it makes for better ideas. I always found that, that questions and, and so-called criticism I actually like it. it. I mean, the first few times it ruffles your feathers a little, but then you learn that that it actually forces you to introspect and examine your ideas and make them better. Um, I did not, how do I wanna say this? It's not like creative class theory, so to speak, um, was a part of my life from day one. 
It was, or part of my intellectual life from day one, it was a very long evolution. And um, I, I, I often like to say part of it was, was stimulated surely by my boyhood, uh, growing up in Newark, New Jersey, um, probably one of the most troubled cities, or if not one of the most troubled city in the advanced world. Uh, as a young boy watching that city depopulate, deindustrialize, and explode into racial conflict and so-called uh, riots. Uh, as a young boy, I think that made an impression on me and made me want to try to understand. Um, my mom worked in the local newspaper there. My dad worked in a factory there. I watched that factory shutter. I think all of that had an impression on a young boy. Uh, and then as a graduate student at Columbia University in the 1980s, I saw New York City as a creative enclave. Um, it, was, it had deindustrialized, it had lost jobs, but it had been attracting intellectuals, writers, musicians, artists. So I think that's the stimulant. Uh, but you know, as a young scholar, I was very much interested in the process of, of capitalist innovation and growth uh, in new economic and production models. Uh, I found myself very interested in the whole debate um, by uh, Michael Peori and Chuck Sable, stimulated around their book, The Second Industrial Divide. Um, I was very interested by the continental uh, so-called regulation school of political economy. And I think just to give everyone context, I think I was able, when I came to the idea of the creative class, to bring together two parts of my intellectual agenda. There was a part of it very interested in the, the processes of capitalist growth, production, organization, innovation, influenced by people like Christopher Freeman, uh, or perhaps influenced by Marx and Schumpeter, and my interest in place and space, which were very separate interests for the first decade and a half or two decades of my career. And I think what happened was, was, was living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, teaching at Carnegie Mellon University, watching Carnegie Mellon create startup company after startup company that would move out of Pittsburgh to the San Francisco Bay Area or greater Boston. I was forced to, to kind of try to think about the role of places and spaces as containers for innovation and economic growth. And at that point, of course, there was a lot of um, conversation about clusters uh, in economic geography by people like Michael Porter. And I think you know, all of us had read Jane Jacobs, but, but we had read the Jane Jacobs of the death and life of great American cities. At that point, I think folks like Ed Glazer, myself, Andres, began to read Jane Jacobs through the eyes of the economy of cities. And maybe Robert Lucas helped us by pointing in that classic article on the mechanics of economic development, the idea of external human capital or returns to human capital or returns to clusters of talent, what he called Jane Jacobs externalities, and I really think my agenda was to try to synthesize the contributions of Mark, Karl Marx, Joseph Schumpeter with those of Jane Jacobs and to situate place at the center of capitalist innovation and growth. And just to put the shorthand on that, I, I really came to understand that if, if, if the, the, the factory and the large vertically integrated company were kind of the platform of innovation and economic growth under industrial age capitalism, that what we were grappling with, beginning to grapple with, was the, the central role of place, community, place, cluster, city, metropolitan area, non-metropolitan area, as kind of the crucial platform of capitalist innovation and growth. And, and I think that was one interest. And the other interest was, was what Nadim said, was looking at the role, the connection between talent or human capital and place. And in, in that context, what got me very interested is that most people back a couple of decades ago were looking at economic geography or place through the lens of the firm or the capitalist organization. And I got this hunch that, that, that and I think it's kind of the old, neo-Marxist in me, that the lens, to, more appropriate lens, or another lens to look at capitalist growth would be occupation. And so we had access to data then, you know, in the late 1990s um, from the U.S. Census and Bureau of Labor Statistics that detailed occupations. And one day I just put my research assistants on organizing the occupational data 
And, and folks, I did not want to, I did not think I had any place talking about class. You know, I, I, I thought my role was to talk about capitalist dynamics, the role of human capital and talent. And the book was not titled The Rise of the Creative Class. It had a different title. And my editor at the time looked at the data, which showed the tremendous growth of this group of occupations around knowledge work, business and financial management, science and engineering, architecture, design, education, law, arts, culture, music. And he said to me, you have documented the rise of a new class. And I had been thinking about the role of mental labor, intellectual labor, the differences with which Marx had talked about physical labor. And, uh, you know, after talking with him many times, he kind of convinced me, and then I had to come up with a rubric. And um, I had, had thought about the intellectual labor, mental labor, knowledge work, and it just struck me that what unified this group of occupations or workers in knowledge work, management work, business work, engineering work, scientific work, entrepreneurial work, arts and cultural work, was their underlying creativity. So anyway, um, we documented the tremendous growth of this group of occupations or class from about in the OECD nations, roughly speaking, about five or 10% of the workforce in 1900 to 15% of the workforce in 1950 to 20% of the workforce in 1980. And then from 1980 to today, we see this explosion in creative work or knowledge work or intellectual labor work or mental labor work. Uh, in the US where I live, it's about 40%. In Canada, well, where I'm, I'm talking to you, where I'm from, where Canada, where I, where I live now, it's about 45% of all occupations. In the leading nations, and, and that group would include Luxembourg, a very small nation where it's over 60%, but you know, this creative class is more than 50% of all occupations in Singapore, Sweden, Israel, Norway, Switzerland, Iceland, the UK, Denmark, and the Netherlands. That, that puts it comparable to the level, the share of work that the proletariat did under the height of the industrial age. So it's a significant group of people. And not only that, because this group of place, group, group of this class is very concentrated, it's even more highly concentrated in leading metropolitan areas. Uh, in the United States, where I know the data the best, although I've consumed the data from other countries, you know, in leading creative class metros, it's 50 to 60% of the workforce. That's places like the Bay Area, Washington, DC, Boston, also college towns like Ann Arbor, Michigan, the University of Michigan, Boulder, Colorado, the University of Colorado, but Iowa City, the University of Iowa, Morgantown, West Virginia, West Virginia University. And also, and this is worth mentioning, and I think the same is true of the UK and the continent, um, over the course of the past decade, stimulated in part by the pandemic, or maybe accelerated, we have seen tremendous growth of the creative occupations in older industrial metros, as those metros have revitalized, um, developed strategies to attract creative talent, invested in culture and amenities, or bolstered that. Um, Baltimore, Maryland, right now, ranks sixth in the concentrated of the creative class ahead of Austin. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I taught at Carnegie Mellon for nearly two decades, was second in our most recent update in growth of the creative class after San Francisco, Buffalo, St. Louis, Cincinnati, Providence, Des Moines, Birmingham, Alabama, Oklahoma City, all are in the large, in the top 10, 20 large mentors for growth of the creative class. And then I, I think I just want to mention, as Nadim said, uh, the creative economy, unlike the industrial economy, is organized in and around cities. Cities or places have replaced the corporation as the core economic and socializing organizing unit. Uh, instead of people being attached to jobs in a corporation with long-term tenure for life, my dad worked in the same eyeglass factory for his entire life. Um, cities are the organizing unit which attaches talent to economic opportunity, which generates clusters of talent. If you look at the research if Andres has done, at Glazer has done, there's pretty convincing evidence that the core function of cities is not only to organize clusters of, innov of, of innovative firms or of firms and other anchor institutions like universities, a core function of cities and communities is to organize talent. As Nadine mentioned, um, I distilled that into a simple formula. The, the story behind that is um, I had an education mother. My dad only had a seventh grade education. My mom finished high school. And my mother every day used to drum into my head what in English is called the three R's. They're not actually three R's. Those three R's are reading, there's one R, writing, W, 
and arithmetic, arithmetic, which is A, but three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic, I decided that if I was going to communicate this to a broad audience, I should create an equation or a formula that my mother could resonate with. And it simply struck me that those T's, the, two, the first two T's were easy, uh, that a place needed and technology assets. Uh, it, needed, it needed technology in the form of industrial research and development, university research and development, technology intensive firms, a la Robert Solo, that a place to compete needed talent. It needed to have great educational institutions, great universities. But the first two T's were flows and they could flow in and out of regions. And I, I call that the Pittsburgh paradox that Pittsburgh was giving rise to a lot of technology. It was creating uh, and attracting a lot of talent both through its un, um, elementary and high schools but also through its universities like Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh. But all of that was flowing out. And at the time I said the great export of Pittsburgh wasn't steel, it was the great technologies and talent Pittsburgh was, was exporting to other regions of the country and the world. And I said that, that what brought those together was a great community, a community of open-mindedness uh, where talented women and men, straight and gay of all ethnicities could come together. Uh, and I call that tolerance. tolerance. I could have called that togetherness. I could have called that a lot of other things, but at the time I called it tolerant, tolerance. And there was a fourth T of course, called quality of place, that all of this came together um, and over time, people have called that a territorial assets or terroir, uh, a quality of place, a constellation of characteristics of places which brought this all together. Um, I don't want to talk too much about the pandemic, um, but, and Andres and I have written about that with our colleague, Mike Storper. What I want to say is that I think what the pandemic has done is accelerated. It, it, someone said this to me the other day, it's like, maybe the pandemic helped you prove your thesis and I don't want to take credit for that. I don't want to say that, but I think what it accelerated is the shift to a talent-based economy um, where, where talent holds relatively more leverage. Remote work has given talented people the ability to call more of their own shots, but the pandemic has accelerated this long and ongoing shift to talent and, and made it so that places that attract and retain talent win, uh, remote work, which, which is very unequal um, uh, factor, it certainly gives uh, more advantaged people and more educated people in the so-called creative class more leverage. It gives the creative class more choices. And I think it solidifies, it, it, it's not this, a disruption, but it solidifies this ongoing shift towards talent. Um, you know, there's been lots of talk about the rise of the rest. My good friend, Steve Case, for, former founder of AOL and the venture capitalist talks about this. I, I just want to put this in context. Um, I think when we talk about the rise of the rest, we're not talking about something that's going on with any one country, but which is occurring across the world. Um, and in a report I did with a fellow named Ian Hathaway, um, what we documented was a pretty stark globalization of innovation and creativity. In the 1990s, the United States accounted for more than 95% of all venture capital that flowed to startups in the world. Uh, you could argue that the Bay Area, greater Boston, Seattle were really the, the global hotbeds of innovation and uh, venture capital financed creativity. By 2017, the world had caught up. The US accounted for less than half of all venture capital investment flowing to its startups. And while the Bay Area still remained in number one position, uh, we documented the rise of global startup hubs like Shanghai and Beijing, Bangalore and Delhi, Tel Aviv, London, Berlin, Paris, Amsterdam, Stockholm, Toronto, and many more. So I think one core dynamic is that, that global creativity and innovation has become a, a much more widely shared or globalized activity. And the second thing I wanted to mention, although this is something that came to me relatively late in my career, was an understanding, um, as Nadine mentioned, that creativity and innovation, while they may look like or while they may be concentrated in superstar cities and leading tech hubs, while creativity and innovation are very spiky, they are very clustered and concentrated, 
that that when you take a deeper dive and you look at the prosperity of places, uh, creativity and innovation, the creative class, culture, artistic and cultural amenities, quality of place-based factors are more important to growth in rural or non-metropolitan areas than they are to urban areas. The data is still out on this, and, and I still think we have to wait till the pandemic is over and certainly have to give it another year. But, but I think in the interim, we can see that the pandemic has caused at the margin a shift towards rural areas. Uh, in the United States, we have this quirky term, Zoom towns, uh, and the United States has a much more decentralized or disaggregated spatial structure than most other places, maybe with the exception of Germany. Um, but I think there, there is an argument that pandemic has made the ability to harness creativity and innovation, talent, cultural growth, given rural or non-metropolitan areas, a better way to do that. So. Uh, let me just talk briefly and, and set the stage for questions about what, what we're seeing happening or what the research suggests is happening in rural or non-metropolitan areas. And, and I want to I want to characterize this by saying when we talk about creativity and innovation in metropolitan and non-metropolitan areas, it's a very unequal, both economically and spatially unequal phenomenon. So although many rural and non-metropolitan areas are prospering, similarly to the way that metropolitan areas are, are prospering, that whether you look at core cities, superstar cities, tech hubs, urban centers, close in suburbs, far off suburbs, non-metropolitan areas or rural areas, there is a significant divide between those which are prospering, harnessing creativity, leveraging innovation, leveraging and exploiting quality of place, and those which are not. And while some are booming or experiencing growth, others are experiencing decay or decline. But here are some statistics from the United States from a report we did um, on the economic circumstances of rural or non-metropolitan areas. 45% of rural counties in the United States grew at a rate that exceeded the median national rate. Wage growth, small rural counties that are not adjacent to major metropolitan areas had the highest wage growth of all county types in the United States in terms of human capital or college graduates. Nearly 45% of rural counties in the United States experienced growth in college graduates at rates above the national average. Here's one which, which I'd love to see the data for Europe. I have not, but, but I'm sure Andres or others have it. Raj Chetty at Harvard um, in his project looking at economic mobility across the United States, one of the findings that his team uh, came up with which is never much talked about, uh, which is buried in their reports, but my great colleague, Bill Bishop, who's now become focused on rural economic development, uh, who wrote this book called The Big Sort, but Bill Bishop was the first to point to my attention, socioeconomic upward mobility in the United States is significantly higher in rural than urban counties. And even though Chetty talks about the high rates of economic mobility in certain metropolitan areas, which are denser, less sprawling, uh, places that, that achieve economic growth. If you look at the highest rates of economic mobility in the United States, they are in rural areas, not urban areas. And there's some reasons for that we can talk about if you like. Um, there is now a wide body of research, part of it stimulated by my work, other of it stimulated by circumstance, on creativity in rural or non-metropolitan areas. The work I know the best is about the United States, but there's also a great deal of work on Europe and the advanced economies in general. The person who I like the best who's done this work is a fellow named Tim Wojan, who was formerly at, until very recently, the US Department of Agriculture in their research division. What Tim's research shows is that the creative class what I call the creative class. And, and that Wojan and his collaborators actually went back and helped to redefine the creative class. Um, when we created this definition, there was not skills data that we could use to partition the occupations. We had to use kind of our best guess, if you will. Wojan was able and his colleagues were able to use detailed data on skills and they refined the measure of the creative class. And, and really they took out just some basic occupations like simple educational occupations or some basic sales occupations. But the, the point correlation between my definition and their refined definition is like 0.96. Uh, 
So they're very similar, but, but Wojin and his colleagues refined the definition, made it more precise, and then looked at its effect. Um, creativity in the creative class, amenities, culture are much more important to rural prosperity and growth than urban prosperity and growth. Rural areas with a high share of creative class residents had job growth rates that were double rural counties with lower creative class presence. Rural counties and establishments that were classified as substantive innovators were more innovative than their urban peers. And rural innovation in general, not only rural economic development, is closely tied to the degree or share of the creative class. Um, what they also found is that quality of life is key to attracting and retaining the creative class in rural areas. Arts and culture, a main finding of theirs is that even the, as the creative class is drawn to rural amenities, waterfronts, lakefronts, oceanfronts, ski slopes, forested areas, great parks, that arts and culture, this is, it sounds so paradoxical, but Nadine mentioned it, is even more highly associated with the creative class, rural rates of creativity and innovation in rural areas or non-metropolitan areas than metro areas. Rural areas with two or more arts organizations, nonprofit or for-profit, they found were five times more innovative than those with zero. So investments in quality of place, in harnessing amenities, in arts and culture. And I think when you look at the role of the pandemic, in spreading population and in the United States, the largest growth in population was not a shift from New York to Miami or San Francisco to Austin, which is much talked about in the popular media. The largest rates of population growth and of creative class or professional attraction were in the rural hinterlands outside of major metropolitan areas. Uh, like the Hudson Valley towns outside of New York City or the areas of the Bay Area that are rural areas outside of San Francisco, similarly with Los Angeles, Boston, Chicago. If you look at why those areas are succeeding, I think you can make the case that they laid the basis before the pandemic. They made huge investments in arts and culture. They made significant investments in, in improving their quality of place. They began to invest, I can give you another example, Prince Edward County outside of Toronto, which has been booming. When I moved to Toronto 15 years ago, the leadership in Prince Edward County, economic development and community leadership were already saying, we are going to invest in a new kind of outdoor recreation. We are going to beautify our lakefront. We are gonna help entrepreneurs and small scale businesses establish bed and breakfast and hotels and campgrounds. We're gonna invest in arts and culture. And I think what happened is for a variety of reasons, both those strategies, but also because superstar cities and metro areas became horrifically expensive, that a group of entrepreneurs uh, in hospitality, in restaurant, in outdoor recreation, began to move to non-metropolitan areas and, is, and in fact set the groundwork began to make the investments that would pay off during the pandemic. And I can talk about all sorts of communities where I work to do that. In any event, um, let me just summarize. Uh, I think that what we're looking at is, is increasingly creativity and innovation being the fuel of economic growth, innovation, job creation, uh, and economic development. However, up to this point, that economic growth, that creativity-fueled innovation has been extraordinarily uneven. It's been uneven in the fact that it's um, disproportionately benefited those with education, college graduates, or those who have the great good fortune to be able to work in creative occupations, about 40 to 50% of the workforce. Uh, the, the creative class has been able to benefit and also deal with higher housing prices while the working and service classes have seen their economic fortunes shrink. There's a great new study by Enrico Moretti and Rebecca Diamond, which document that. Um, as the creative class has prospered, other classes have not prospered, seen their economic situation worsen. Uh, geographically, we've seen an increasing spatial divide, but I want to note this, and I call that a winner-take-all geography. But it's not just a winner-take-all geography across cities or metropolitan areas. It's a winner-take-all geography, which is fractal and occurs across every scale. 
uh, where there are winners and losers across core cities, superstar cities, tech hubs, suburban areas, and rural and non-metropolitan areas. And I think the winners are a larger group than losers at each and every spatial scale. And I think the hard part, and maybe Andres and I can dig into it because he's a fantastic expert in it, as are many of you, while we can see that there are rural areas that have been able to invest in arts and culture, natural amenities, urban amenities, that are at the borders of larger metropolitan areas, they're in the catchment area of large metropolitan areas like London or Paris or New York or San Francisco, that are home, uh, in the United States there are many of these, many more than in Europe, that are home to good colleges and universities that may have airport access, that while those rural areas have prospered and actually seen their fortunes increase during the pandemic, that in fact the preponderance of rural areas are still areas of decline and economic dysfunction and disarray. And, and part of our strategy has to be how do we develop better strategies for those places and the people who occupy those places uh, to experience better prosperity and have better life prospects. So thanks for your patience and listening to me. And I'm particularly looking forward to our conversation with Andres and all of you. Thank you very much, Richard. And uh, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. I guess that if we were not in a webinar sort of setting, if we were all together, there would be a, a round of applause, a big round thank of applause you. for your talk. And uh, I'm really uh, grateful that you actually were far more positive than many of us uh, have been thinking about the role and the potential of many, let's say, intermediate uh, regions, uh, lagging regions, rural areas that seem to be doing better, not just in the US, but also in many parts of the world. Um, before I start with uh, the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that uh, if you have questions, as uh, some have already uh, put in the, in the question and answer session, you can start putting them online to Richard. And after our talk, uh, I'll be going over these questions and uh, selecting as many as we can in order to try to answer what is uh, uh, many actually questions that uh, may have arisen during your talk. But let me start with this whole idea that in the end, you mentioned the pandemic. You said you were not going to talk about the pandemic, but the pandemic has been, and I think I'm grateful for that, a big protagonist uh, in your talk and a big protagonist in what many have regarded a potential change in uh, the winner-take-all geography that was mainly concentrated in big cities. Um, many have been talking about the opportunities that uh, new technologies offer to remote work. And uh, you mentioned the question of Zoom towns in, in the US, the importance of uh, working remotely, especially for creatives, how they have managed and how this might reverse the more or less four decades we saw of uh, massive concentration of economic activity in a few areas. But is this really true? Is this happening? I, I, I like when you ended up that uh, this winner take all is happening now at all levels and there are more winners than losers. But can every lagging region have the sort of cultural amenities, the closeness to natural parks, to ski resorts, mm -hmm. the sort of, let's say, conditions and quality of life that uh, many people in the highly educated creative class actually cherish? No, so the answer is no. And I think that's, I, I, you know, we can dig into this and, and what we do. I, I think there's a couple of things going on. One, I think there's very little evidence. There, there is some evidence that the creative class at the margin has decentralized a little. That there are some members of the creative class, particularly with families. I, I think this is young, like, look, young people are going back to cities in record rates. But I think with families in the, and I want to qualify this, in the United States, because of the unique conditions of violence and urban disorder, that families have decentralized and they've decentralized to three kinds of places in the United States. The first is very wonderful walkable suburbs um, of which there's not many, you know, there's a couple of dozen in the United States, walkable suburbs. The second group of places are what we'd call the rise of the rest cities, the Nashvilles, the Austins, um, the Miamis. What has happened, you know, and, and for folks listening in, I, I always invoke Steve Case because I love the guy and he's so positive. He calls it the rise of the rest. I call it the rise of the rents. And, and what we've seen is a, a soaring of housing prices and rents 
in these places where, where Miami has become the second most unaffordable community in the United States. And then to these particular rural hotspots, the Zoom towns, the Bozeman, Montana's, the Hudson Valley, New York's, the wonderful ski slopes of Colorado, the areas of the Bay Area that have the wonderful wineries. But yeah, this is a very narrow group of places. And it begs the question, how do we help the truly the less advantaged? And we can get to that. One of the things I worry about, where I think you are in a much better position in Europe and Canada is in a much better position, if you look at the level of political polarization in the United States, and we agree that polarization is happening everywhere, it really makes it hard to envision strategies other than very local strategies to pull up lagging rural places in the United States, that there is, it's very difficult to think of national strategies. Whereas in Canada or Europe, you can envision bolder place-based policy approaches. So. Yeah, I think the real question this begs is what do we do with the half of places or more, 50 or 60 percent of places that are not able to insert themselves into this area of talent, innovation, creativity, uh, and that are falling behind even further? Let me just go into the whole issue of uh, the places that seem to be rising. And you mentioned three types of places, which I think is very interesting. But my question is, are these new places or are the same old places? The places where the creative class of New York and the Bay Area already had the secondary homes where they went skiing beforehand and uh, where they actually sometimes they concentrated some of their investments. Are we seeing really new places emerging in the US or anywhere else that uh, were not already on a way to on a track to doing better no. um, and which are, what have they done if you find any of those? No, I, I don't think so. I, I think you're as usual, absolutely right. And you know, one thing that I always say for folks listening in, and I don't know if this is as true of Europe. So, so you have to deal with this, this American, right? So I apologize for that. But you know, I am an ex hippie. I played rock and roll. I had long hair and I was very influenced by the sixties. If you look at 60s culture, which actually has a big influence on my work, trying to think through the effect of the 60s on not just popular culture, but on the economy, the hippie movement or the music movement or the artistic movement was very rural in the United States. Now, I, I mean, I'm saying I'm not sure, but they were going to the communes. They were going to the, the Bob Dylan was already in Woodstock, the band, the music from Big Pink. They were already in the Hudson, Jackson Pollock, the action painters, the Hudson, they were already there. And, you know, the reason that Stam Festival got started is because that fellow who made the festival, Woodstock, went up there to establish a, a recording studio because there were so many musicians living there. And he said, well, there's so many people living here, we can have a music festival. And that created the Woodstock we know of. So I think there has always been this rural creativity or rural amenity or draw for the creative soul. And, and I think in, in some of those places, it was that kind of artistic and musical cluster. In other places, it was a ski slope, you know what I'm saying, or, or a mountaintop. Um, and then in other places, you know, I do a lot of work in Bentonville. Um, and Bentonville is seen now as a tremendous success story. A small area, not quite rural, right? It's, it's a metropolitan area, but a part of Arkansas that's booming. Well, why is it booming? You know, it has three Fortune 100 companies. Of course, the one we all know is Walmart, but it has the transportation company, J.D. Hunt, and a um, Tyson, a food producer. It has a great, uni a good university, the University of Arkansas in the metropolitan area. Uh, and now it has a large family foundation, the Walton Family Foundation, that is deploying hundreds of millions of dollars, or not billions of dollars, into creating a state-of-the-art art museum, state-of-the-art hotel and hospitality, state-of-the-art restaurants, wonderful biking trails. So yeah, it, it, there, there's a lot of path dependence here and it's, it's hard to see. You know, I always call Austin it, it, a, an overnight success story that took four decades to make. I, I think it's hard to, to really pinpoint a new place that emerged de novo. I would say a, the preponderance of these places are places that had tremendous assets to begin with, that were attracting, that were second home destinations or rural outposts, that the pandemic has excelled. And by the way, my own hunch on this is that things are reverting more towards the previous norm. 
that, that, that what we're seeing gradually is reversion back. And the last thing to revert is really work. Almost everything else, travel patterns, you know, arts and cultural patterns, sporting event patterns, even movie theaters are back. The last thing to come back is, is work. And I think we're going to see some, not we're not going to see a full rebounding there, but we'll see some. Thank you. I'm going to try to bring you to this side of the Atlantic on some of the things that are happening or have been happening here since the pandemic and how they might affect the growth of, uh, let's say, economic development in areas that uh, traditionally have been lagging behind. And uh, 2020 saw the biggest, let's say, race to buy secondary homes, uh, mainly by people from big cities uh, in uh, most parts of our countries. Uh, and in the case of France, it was very clear that um, probably uh, if my memory doesn't fail me, it more than doubled the number of purchases that we saw in the previous years. And most of these purchases were not in cities, they were in medium sized towns in lagging behind regions in regions that were intermediate in rural, rural areas. But it was a funny sort of geography in the case yeah. of France, in which most of the new purchases were to the west of the country. In uh, Brittany, in uh, Pays de la Loire, in places like Nouvelle Aquitaine, but there was much less in terms of other areas that in terms of, and that's my perception, natural beauty uh, are not that different in uh, places like, for example, in the east of uh, France, in places uh, like Bourgogne or in Franche Comté. Um, so that's creating a significant imbalance in which you have on the one hand, uh, creatives, people who could work remotely that said, we're not going to be caught by another lockdown mm -hmm. in Paris, we're going to be in the countryside where we can just take walks and enjoy life and perhaps uh, not suffer the consequences of early curfews. Uh, whereas, and those areas may be booming, there were the areas that were doing relatively well before, before, whereas the older, very often industrial declining areas, in the rural areas close to, let's say, the traditional mines have struggled much more. Do you think this divide is going to continue? And uh, if it continues, what can be done for those areas that seem to be losing out? So I think you're absolutely right. And I think the pattern is very similar. You know the pattern on the continent better than I do. I know the pattern in North America better. Um, I, I think the first consequence of this, and which most of my applied work is now for folks listening in. So 2017, when I wrote The New Urban Crisis, I was invited to lots of places, boom towns and you know, towns that were declining. And whenever I would give a speech or give a talk or do consulting in the places that were not experiencing growth, I would say, watch out what you wish for. It's coming to you. As, as soon as you develop a trajectory, not like, like Austin, you're going to see housing prices rise. You're going to see greater inequity. You're going to see rise in economic inequality. And I think nearly 90% of the applied work I'm doing is going back to those places and they're going, oh my God, we got devastated. That the pandemic has led to a surge in housing prices that local people can no longer afford to own a home. In their terms, the New Yorkers have taken over. They've driven housing prices up. And, and so I think for these outside areas, metropolitan and non-metropolitan areas, that, that amenity-driven growth or creative class-driven growth leads to success. It leads to job creation and higher rates of innovation, but it also leads to all sorts of problems, which are higher rates of housing prices, higher housing affordability. And, and those problems compound more in those areas because they're smaller, they have less social housing, they have less services. And then the other part of it, there are just places that have been left behind. And, and how we deal with them, there's, a, and we can talk about this, there's a great new report by a fellow I really admire, Tim Bartek of the Upjohn Institute, which, which he said to me, and Tim is a very humble person, he thinks it's the best thing he's ever done. So I, I can find it, but it's just released from the Upjohn Institute on place-based development. And he argues, now this is given the unique characteristics of the United States, that, that even in this shift to place-based policy with the Biden administration and build back better stuff I've been very close to and these attempts to build clusters, which is still very metropolitan, by the way, he argues that the, the real mechanism to do this is the state level. 
I could argue with him why that might not be the case because the states are divided. And he argues that what the states need to do is two kinds of block grants. So he's arguing that if you want to really help places left behind, it's not enough just to help people. You have to invest in places, something that you're very keen on, I know. And he argues that you need two kinds of, of block grants, which provide a wide portfolio of assistance. Labor market assistance. So at the metropolitan area or the non-metropolitan area, providing broad labor market assistance to strengthen the labor market, create jobs. But the other one are neighborhood level or community level at the metropolitan and non-metropolitan area to strengthen neighborhood conditions. And he argues doing those two things at the level of the state or the province would be mechanisms to help raise up the bottom. But I, I, think, I think this is the real hard question, that the new creative economy or meant the intellectual labor economy or knowledge economy has such strong winner-take-all dynamics for places and classes that it's hard. It is really hard to think about strategies to lift the bottom. Thank you. Uh, second uh, evidence from Europe, and this comes from uh, Ricker Erickson and his research from the University of Umeå on the, the mobility of uh, graduates in Sweden. And he finds that, uh, yes, there's mobility, that uh, graduates normally move from university towns to big cities. And then very often, as you were saying for the case of the US, when they have children, they move out into, let's say, uh, medium-sized cities and more remote regions to, let's say, find better schools, better quality of life, uh, bigger housing, a more affordable sort of living. But what he also finds is that as soon as they move, their productivity goes down. Yep. Uh, so that uh, the young and dynamic that move to places like uh, Stockholm or uh, Gothenburg or Malmo, they are pushing the boundaries. They are, let's say, uh, creating more innovation and the sort of innovation and type of culture that makes these places uh, dynamic and booming. Once they move out, they seem to mellow and they seem to become less productive. Is this something that is going to condemn many of these cities in the long run to become, let's say, places for better quality of life, but without the economic dynamism that might fuel the sort of revival that many of us are expecting? Yeah, that's a, yes. And, and I think, you know, it, it's real. I always, from in Rise of the Creative Class, I talked about the front-loaded career. I mean, that was one of the chapters, the front-loaded career where young people really front load. And then, and then you kind of, I don't want to say you coast, but you front load and you work like the Dickens. Look, we have tremendous evidence that in terms of innovative activity, not in terms of simple activity, innovative activity, clustering, co-location, face-to-face interaction is essential. And, and I don't think, no matter what people say, this technology, I just, I just was with the head of research at Meta and um, talking, about, I, talking about the metaverse. And, and this is the guy who's inventing the metaverse, whether you like Meta or not. What he said was, there are lots of things we can do in the metaverse, but we'll never have the bandwidth of face-to-face -face interaction. Never. Lots of things. You can exercise. You can be on a ski slope. You can be in a game. You can be do better than Zoom. But you're not the bandwidth we have in a real community, you're not going to make in the digital world. So that's his point. Um, yeah, I, I think that what happens in, in, this is more acute in the United States than in Europe be, because of urban violence and because urban schools are just pretty awful. Yeah, you, you see people move outside of the major cities and metropolitan areas when they have families. And I think it's absolutely, yeah, we spend, look, I'll be quite honest with you. We spend the winter in Miami Beach. I don't see that many people working. I mean, maybe it's just me, but I don't see a work, a lot of work going on in Miami Beach the way I see a lot of work going on in London or Paris or New York or Toronto. So yeah, I, I think that's right. And people develop different priorities. And maybe, maybe the question for us is how do we develop a demographic and spatial division of labor that makes this productivity innovation work better while enabling some decentralization or some disaggregation and some higher quality of life. Maybe that's something, instead of thinking of urban versus rural, metro versus non-metro, maybe think about the system. I know you do, Andres, but I'm saying for all of us, the system, the spatial system, and how that system can work to benefit all of our productivity, it, it certainly makes sense. 
intellectually. If, if young people with energy and ambition, and you know, my, here, my dad told me this, the guy with a seventh grade education, he said, if we wanted engineers to make the factory better, seventh grade education, we better hire new engineers. The older engineers, their skills decay. This guy with a seventh grade education, he's like, the new engineer coming out of university has all the new tools. So, so it may be that from a, from a point of view, a system point of view, we're better off letting the youngsters inhabit the city, take over those small spaces and encouraging some dissent. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm saying it may be the case. The problem with that, of course, is what's happening now with remote work is that you lose the ability of the older generation or older cohort of workers to mentor the younger. And I think we're seeing that in real time. The younger are still flowing into the big metropolitan areas. The older have left and creating that mentoring capability is harder. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks for that. That was very interesting. But let me just go to the third piece of evidence from Europe. And this one comes from the UK. Uh, the latest statistics about regions in the UK uh, after the pandemic um, just came out in the month of June and highlighted that there were two regions in the UK that were above pre-pandemic levels in terms of uh, levels of GDP per head, which were, surprise, surprise, Greater London and uh, Northern Ireland for probably different reasons because it's the only part of the UK that remains within the single market. But it was London, all the rest, including for example, the West Midlands that was fully uh, the worst performer and 10% below uh, pre-pandemic levels uh, were doing much worse. Uh, so despite the fact that the, in the UK, we have a government that has put a lot of political capital in terms of leveling up and has published a white paper on leveling up, that in Europe, we have a long tradition, uh, both at national and especially European level, of trying to create the conditions that you would in many ways like, perhaps not in terms of culture and amenities and creativity, but certainly in terms of making these places accessible, improving education, mm -hmm. and trying to attract firms and generating innovation, that uh, geography seems to be very stubborn, as you were saying quite a few years ago, and uh, that uh, it's going to be very difficult to reverse. Um, now more than in terms of rural areas, but for cities like Birmingham in the West Midlands or for cities uh, like, for example, Metz and um, uh, Nancy in uh, Lorraine, or for cities like, for example, let's say many of the cities in North Northern Italy um, that were until relatively recent uh, leaders in economic activity and leaders in economic dynamism and in creativity and they were cherished and that now seem to be falling behind, what sort of solutions that would be different, specifically targeting those uh, industrial declining areas, especially taking into account that you are from New York, uh, in the outskirts of New York, but you also lived in Pittsburgh for quite some time, that has been one of the cities that seems to have been able to successfully mm -hmm. uh, build on its industrial past and do a full 180 degree turnaround. So again, absolutely correct. It, it seems to me, just thinking about this in this forum with you, that what we've been able to do with an emphasis on innovation and knowledge work, the creative class, amenity, culture, is extend the rise to about half of places, I'm making this rule of thumb, the 45% of rural areas that I documented, and half of the population, that we've been able to lift the boat uh, these are crude, 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 crude rubrics. Lift the boat of about half the population. And remember, the creative class don't all have college degrees. Um, it, only six in 10 members of the creative class have a college education. Four in 10 are in an occupation that enables them to use their creativity. And I think about 50% of places now, you could argue based on the rubrics I have, have been able to achieve some level of innovative growth and success. But that means about 50% have not. And I think we could argue have seen their fortunes sag and about half the population have seen their fortunes sag. So my hunch is that we have to continue to work to spread growth and innovation and creativity because there's stuff that will drive future growth. 
But we also have to work at equity and inclusive prosperity. And that's really the hard part. So, so what I see happening is that in all of the non-metropolitan or second tier metropolitan places that have experienced growth or success, they become more unequal and their politics have become more polarized and ugly. So, so whether you look at Austin or Nashville or Pittsburgh or Miami, people there are angry, much angrier now than they were before. And in their view, what they see, and this is the US, I'm sure that what they see in the UK is Londoners, what they see in France is Parisians, what they see in the US is New Yorkers, and they don't like them. The New Yorkers pay more for housing, they bid up the cost of housing, they have more money, they're loud, they're rude, they, they're destroying my community. Then you, everywhere I go, I hear this, they're taking our school slots. So I think what it's done is very interesting, is all those places that used to want a strategy for growth are now rethinking and saying, they don't call this inclusive prosperity, that's our word. They're now saying, oh my God, we need more affordable housing. Oh my God, we need more workforce housing. Oh my God, we need more equitable growth and development. It, all these things we tried that worked actually caused us to recalibrate. So I think in the second in Pittsburgh, you saw in Pittsburgh, um, my great friend, the mayor, Bill Peduto, who actually was the first political leader who saw this trajectory for Pittsburgh and helped do it. He was, he lost the election. He lost the election to a African-American progressive. Great, terrific guy, terrific, also a terrific mayor. But the African-American progressive mayor was saying, you've created prosperity for the creative class. You've created prosperity for the Carnegie Mellon graduate. You've not created prosperity for the Pittsburgh steel worker or steel working community. So I think it's tilted the balance towards a convert. And, and the hard part is that those places are not equipped. Um, Newark is different. Newark is equipped to deliver inclusive prosperity. But a place like Austin, Texas, or Nashville, or Bozeman, Montana, or my, or their equivalents in Europe, don't have any clue. And I'll give you the example. When asked, with the second most unaffordable housing in the United States, when asked how to achieve more affordable housing in the city of Miami, the current mayor, who is lauded by techies and venture capitalists, said, just tell them to get a better job with the tech company. It's, it's so, so yeah, I think, I think we're dealing with a situation now, all of the tools that we've developed to begin to think about raising the bottom, develop, they're going to have to be applied in second and third tier uh, cities and metropolitan areas, as well as in all metropolitan areas. Okay, the questions from the audience are coming thick and fast. We have at the moment 14. I had a last question, but I'm going to link it to one uh, from the, the audience, which I think is actually relevant. We have been talking a lot about two of your T's, which are technology and talent. We have left the tolerance a bit behind. And you mentioned um, the anger, the level of discontent that is appearing now in many of uh, the OECD countries, um, the polarization in terms of politics and the cultural wars that you're very familiar with, especially in the US. And uh, the question is, how does, let's say, attitudes and the polarization of attitudes, uh, the sometimes the lack of tolerance that is identified with a sort of, let's say, tolerance that you define as you define it in your work, um, how can this be reversed? And I'm going to link it to uh, Yuri Blagic's uh, um, from Charles University in Prague. Uh, question about uh, the the role of tolerance is to what extent is tolerance vital, especially when, for example, Chinese cities are Chinese technology hubs, hotspots are moving ahead, but they still remain with a very extensive social control and with limited limited openness, diversity, and I would say in many cases cultural amenities. Um. Wow, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm nervous. And, uh, you know, I, I know enough about history. You know, it comes around first time as tragedy, second time as farce, but the parallels to the 1920s are not lost on me. I, I, I you know, I try to avoid this. I'm a very optimistic person, as you know. I, I, like, I like to look at the world optimistically, but these are difficult times and, and you know, they're particularly difficult in the United States. I, I see such a staggering difference between Canada and the United, never mind Europe, such a staggering difference. 
you know, you, you not only have intolerance rising in the United States, and, and you, you and I have written about this, it's, it's, it's really the concentration of advantage in certain areas that leads to this backlash, which is not economic, but it's cultural. People in, in less advantaged places, the left behind, as you call them so, so accurately, are angry about these cultural changes. Um, they, they are more traditional. That's why they never moved. They're, they're, they're high on diligence and, 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 and they're not high on openness to experience or extroversion. They, they love traditional community. They're wedded to the traditional family. They have traditional norms. They see all the rise of women, the rise of the gay community, the rise of as threats to their way of life. And then these populist political actors have figured out a way to tap into that. What, what worries me is now in, in certain states, in the United States and, and, and in particular, I don't know the case in Europe as much, but let's look at Florida and Texas. It, it's, it, it, yes, it's the attack on gay rights and women's rights, but it, it's now a direct assault on corporations. You know, the governor of Florida has led direct attacks on Disney and on the baseball franchise. I mean, this kind of thing is, is just terrifying. So yeah, I think we'll see more of it. I think at the end of the day, it really penalizes innovation. You, you need open, open systems are required for innovation. If you don't have open systems and a flow of talent and a flow of different kinds of talent, different kinds of cognition, which is associated with ex ethnic and racial and gender diversity, we know this from the psychology literature, you get lower levels of innovation. So it seems to me that the places that can support this, whether those be in Europe or Canada, maybe the parts of the United States will benefit. And, and so I, what I point, remember I pointed to that globalization of the innovation hubs? You know, it wouldn't surprise me to see the Torontos, the Stockholms, the Copenhagens of the world. You mentioned Berlin. London has certainly seen this trajectory to see all of those places increase their ability to attract talent and innovators. Um, I'm less, to be honest with you, less, China less concerns me because I think of all the things you said, it's going to be very hard. China can do lots of things well, but I think stimulating new innovation will be a lot harder. So, so yeah, what, what strikes me is the rise of the rest, if you will, a, across the world. And that I think is places which were open, tolerant, don't have a lot of violence, don't have a lot of conflict and can organize themselves in a reasonable way. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. As I said before, there are a lot of questions. There are 14 questions already. Some of them I think you have more or less answered during your our discussion, but uh, there are a lot of uh, very interesting questions that remain. And I think it's only fair since you mentioned him during your intervention that we give the first question to Tim Woyan. Uh, he asks that there's increasing evidence that those best able to solve really tough problems, those that are most creative, are those who also pursue an arts avocation. Yep. Might there be a rural dividend to the lower pace of life that provides the freedom to pursue both career and avocation? Yep. You know, T Tim, thank you for being on. I didn't know you were on, that your work has been... I mean, Tim's work is the essential. You know, it, it's almost that we have two Tims, Tim Wojan and Tim Bartek. And if you take them as a piece, you know, you get the story. So Tim, thank you for everything you've done and for being so provocative and always, always challenging me. Like Tim's not easy on me. I have to, I have to just say this, he's, he's tough on me and, and I've appreciated that. I think this has always been the case. And Tim, I think you know it, that, that the creative soul have, might have set, sought, sought out a Greenwich Village at one point. But that creative soul gets overstimulated. Uh, the hubbub of urban life makes it hard to focus and concentrate. And that urban soul has often retreated either part-time or full-time to a more rural life where focus and concentration and day-to-day -day activity is easier. And, you know, I, I, I had this interview with a great physicist in, that I wrote about in Rise of the Creative Class. And the great physicist told me, I tend to stay in my study most of the time and try to work out these equations, but every now and then I need stimulation. So I walk down the hallways and just pull people out for random conversations. And I think this is what a creative person kind of needs. They need excitement and stimulation and repose. 
So yeah, I think there is a rural dividend, but as Tim, as you said so accurately, and so it's not every rural place. You, you have the list, I mean, more than me. I forget, Tim has a list of roughly a hundred. I'm making, he has the, the real list, but, but there are rural places that have been able to do this. And then many more rural places that have not been able to take advantage of this rural capacity. So yeah, yeah, I, I think it's there. I think it's very important. I think we need to understand it. And the other thing I think for our point of view is that once the flywheel gets going in the rural area, then it begins to become expensive. And then the final thing I'll say, which I've also learned from Tim, I don't know if this is true in Europe. So Andres, you have to tell me if it's true. What happens in the United States in our metropolitan classification scheme is every time a rural area becomes successful, it graduates to become a metropolitan area. Does that make sense? So, so as it becomes successful and adds population and density, and it's often at the fringe of the existing metropolitan areas, it gets consumed. So, so in many ways, the most successful rural areas over time become metropolitan. So I, I'll just add that as another uh, qualification. Well, here in, in Europe, we have uh, different classifications by countries, so still, we're still struggling in that respect. But uh, there are quite a lot of other questions, and I'm going to go for Ter Janssen who asks, what are your thoughts about remote work leading to a further globalization of intellectual work with the already most established companies uh, attracting even more talent and smaller and less established companies experiencing an even stronger brain drain? As competition for the best jobs increases, will this create discontent in educated yet not multilingual outstanding professionals losing their jobs for foreign candidates. In other words, is this going to actually exacerbate uh, the quest for talent and the concentration of talent in certain areas? Um, you know, it seems to me, and I'm no expert on this, but it, it seems to me every time we get a new technology, let's call that the telegraph, the telephone, the automobile, the plane, the internet, remote work, Zoom, that is supposed to decentralize things, it, it does. It, it, it certainly allows the word to become more global, but it actually at the same time concentrates activity. And, and so it would seem to me that, that we have two possibilities. I think that we're going to see new innovation hubs emerge. I think we're already seeing that. And I, I think we're going to see that in very advanced, sophisticated places that don't have a lot of intolerance. I mentioned them already. I think that we're also going to see though, and on a global scale, we're going to see some real concentration in, in, in significant superstar cities. Uh, more so as, as people who may have opportunity from remote work, then begin to say, well, I can migrate. Um, I have this remote work job connected to some company in London, Paris, Stockholm, Berlin, Toronto, New York. And over time, I'd really like to migrate my family there because opportunities are generally better. So yeah, I, I, I don't see our geography being substantially altered by remote work. Let's go to the next question. This is from Atle Hauge at Inland University in Lillehammer in Norway. And it's about this dichotomy that we often, often use between urban and rural. And he says, we discuss along urban rural dimensions, urban and rural lines, but many of the places that do best now are small cities. Places where we can, one can enjoy a rural quality of life, but live an urban, more or less urban lifestyle. Is it not time that we focus on smaller cities as a unit of analysis? Uh, and not as something that is falls in between the cracks of the metropolitan rural uh, divide. Yes. And I think what we do is we try to work at all these scales as best we can. And I think we try to do two things. And I think we've not done enough of the two things be because we tend to emphasize growth and innovation and creativity because we know that stimulates economic development. But we also need to be prepared for the downside or challenges of that. So particularly in second and third tier cities, as soon as they get the flywheel in motion, they begin to get extraordinarily problems with housing inventory and housing affordability and inequity. I would say those problems, London, Paris, Stockholm, Berlin, in my country, New York, they're older cities 
because of population pressures and challenges a century ago, even before we had extensive social welfare states, were forced to develop social housing, services to the less advantaged, poverty mitigation services, economic and community development services, but those don't exist in second and third tier cities, particularly post, when I, when, when I say post-industrial, I don't mean post-industrial cities, I mean cities that grew after industrialization, the Nationals, the Miamis, the Phoenixes, the new cities, they just don't have that. And, and those, those cities, the problems of poverty, homelessness, um, um, inequity, housing affordability are extraordinary. I, I mean, their, their problems to my mind look much worse than the problems of New York or San Francisco. And, and what I see happening, and may, I, I wonder if you see this happening as much in Europe. What I see happening in the United States is a ver very interesting race to the bottom locally. So initially we saw a race to the bottom in the federal government with the rise of reactionary politics. But local governments didn't have that. Local governments were all tending to focus on economic growth and some level of inclusive prosperity. Now, I think what you've seen with the remote work and decentralization and the rise of these new tech hubs like Austin and Miami is really the attempt by certain libertarian technology entrepreneurs and venture capitalists to promote a race to the bottom locally. So, so to, to make the case that New York and San Francisco and London and Paris and Toronto are too woke. And they're too focused on solving problems of race and gender and equity. And that these new tech hubs, we'll call them Austin and Miami, are much more libertarian. They have lower taxes, they have less services. But what we're seeing is an explosion of housing unaffordability and equity, inequity in those places. So I think we have to focus on both levels, stimulating innovation and growth, but also addressing these, these issues of inclusive prosperity. Thanks. Uh, the next question um, is probably one that might be directed to Tim Wadham more than uh, you, but uh, this is from uh, Marcel Royou of the World Bank, and it's about the whole idea that usually well-performing rural areas are part of uh, functional urban areas. Do you have examples of well-performing rural areas that are not part of a larger functional urban area? I think that's absolutely true. I mean, if I look at Tim's categories, roughly, proximity to a major metropolitan area, presence of a college or university, proximity to a major airport, those three, and then you have a high level of natural and uh, amenity and then investment in arts and culture, roughly. So yeah, I would think the preponderance of them are in a major or adjacent to a major metropolitan area, but. But I do think in the US, in a time of air travel and extravagant wealth, you can get some, some further away. I, I think there are examples of, look, you can make the argument that the places in, Miami, in Montana or Wyoming or Colorado are reasonably close to metropolitan areas, but they're not close to superstar cities. So yeah, I, I think you can find examples. And, and you mentioned this earlier, Andres, and I didn't I think you also have a herd mentality effect. You know, when I was a young scholar thinking about industrial location, a fellow named Raymond Vernon, famous Raymond Vernon, and I was trying to understand why companies locate, and he said, Richard, it's all herd mentality. You know, when Ford or Toyota locates somewhere, a bunch of other companies follow. I think the same thing is kind of true of rural location. You know, you were saying these places in France. I think once a few urbanites start to go there, they get hot. And, and then, you know, you have this kind of perverse thing happening where it's, it's not just the creative class, but it really is the point, it's the 1%. You know, when the 1% discovers an area, Aspen, Bozeman, Jackson, you, you have the equivalents, Sardinia. We have all the equivalents in Europe. Those places take off on fire because they all want to be there. So, yeah, I, I, I think it's the case, but, but, you know, you have to just be careful what you wish for. Okay, on arts and culture and amenities. And this question is from Jegor's uh, Wolchak. Um, when you talk amen about amenities and arts and culture, when you plot them, uh, which are the ones that you think matter more for the development of these, uh, let's say, intermediate regions, lagging behind regions, rural areas? Is there some minimum standard for the quality of life that is a necessary condition for 
the benefits of having arts and culture and amenities to kick in? Well, Wojin says one or two arts organizations. Sorry, Tim, to be just talking about you. Um, one or two, you know, the, 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 the one or two arts organizations have a propulsive effect. Now, the question is that endogenous or not? Is that a function of what we just said before? Are they close to a major metropolitan area? Blah, 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 blah. Tim will know better than me. Um, it seems to me arts organization of any type matter. And, and it seems to me then also this emphasis on natural amenities, making natural amenities work for you. And the two in combination really work together. Um, where they work together, where you get some level of natural amenity and some level of artistic amenity combined with hospitality and tourism and restaurants and hotel, then you start to get the flywheel in motion. But I think for rural places, the message is that, that, that you're much better off focusing on arts and culture and a higher quality of life than trying to lure factories. I mean, I, I think that's the baseline message. If, if you wanna up, up yourself, you know, working with your natural amenities, developing arts and culture, working with hospitality entrepreneurs, restaurateurs and hoteliers to create spaces that are interesting, that, that will work. And I mean, my best example of that, I can give you many examples, but it's Prince Edward County, which is an hour and a half from where I'm sitting now. I mean, this was a backward, falling apart, deindustrialized rural area that is now becoming a real hotspot. You know, it's a it's extraordinary quality of life, extraordinary food, you know, beautiful laid back hotels. It's attracting people from Toronto. Yeah, I, I think there's a message in that, that there's a different way of rural development with a caveat that that rural development is, is premised upon an advantaged group of people, right? It, it is not creating balanced growth and development. It's creating creative class growth and development. I'm going to go now, you mentioned several times in your talk, the issue of skyrocketing house, house prices in these hot spots, these Zoom towns, these areas that seem to be doing well, especially after the pandemic. And um, in the US, there has been a big debate about how to deal with that and what is the best way of promoting, um, let's say, affordability and housing affordability in these areas. And uh, most of the dominant discourse is let's build and let's build higher in the most uh, central areas. And there's a question by Gianfranco Uliozzo, which uh, probably reflects a bit the European sort of um, sensitivities. And it's, it's, it's historical heritage, a better pool to talent than new shining buildings. Um, do you need to, in order to attract this pool of talent to regenerate by recovering the character of the city or by destroying and rebuilding shiny new buildings? Yeah, you know, I, I tend to agree. I, I'm EMB, don't get me wrong. I, I know that we have to add more housing, but what happens folks and I, I think the, the revolution in urban economics is the most positive development in social sciences and urbanism that I've seen. And I tend to read more urban economists than anyone else, any other co co cohort. But what happens is when you let urban economists into this discourse, they think in binaries. They don't understand the texture of cities. They don't understand the history of cities. They don't understand what makes a great neighborhood. They understand the laws of supply and demand. And so they'll start by saying, oh my God, we have to build more housing. And isn't it great that Houston is affordable because they sprawled like crazy. So then we have to encourage more sprawl. And then they'll wake up one day and go, oh shit, that, no, no, no. What we really need is more vertical sprawl. We need more tall buildings. If we just have more tall buildings, no, that will alleviate the housing problem. The problem is that, that people want to, what, they're, what the demand is for is great communities. And, and look, we've been talking about this. People want to live in great urban communities. Europe is filled with these, right? You, you know, but in, in my country, Soho, Tribeca, areas of San Francisco, Georgetown and Washington, D.C., Boston and Toronto, these, the neighborhood I live in, um, which are walkable, mixed use, to use Moreno's form, 15 minute neighborhoods, whether you like that or not. Great suburban communities, what people, where there's real demand in the U.S. I don't know the, in the U.S. because there's, are these urban suburbs. This is where we've seen housing prices. Sky and 
you know, when people move from New York or San Francisco to Atlanta or Nashville or Miami, they're moving not to those communities, they're moving to the two urban suburbs. They're not moving to, to sprawl or the big, and, and the other problem with big buildings, I just have to be honest with you, is not only do they not, they, they often take action off the street. They, they often create a kind of vertical sprawl when what we know is we need this action on the street. That's what historic neighborhoods are great at. Historic neighborhoods just, or Jane Jacobs told us all the reasons why. But um, big buildings are also not family friendly. Now they can be, but in general, big buildings are marketed at this same young demographic. So. If we're going to build density in urban areas, we have to build it with an eye towards mixed use, family-friendly communities. That's not happening. Um, and, and so I think one of the big things is family-friendly multifamily development has to be something we push for. But generally speaking, the scale of development that we should be thinking about is not skyscrapers versus small, but how do we create more great neighborhoods? And how do we increase, I think the questioner said this better than I can, how do we increase density at the margin in great neighborhoods such that we don't ruin those neighborhoods. How we can add density. We don't need 50 stories. Not, not saying there can be great 50 story buildings. I'm not saying we shouldn't build 50 story buildings, but the bigger, the better question is how do we build great neighborhoods and how do we increase density without destroying the very limited supply? The real question then is how do we build new neighborhoods that are great? That is a big, big question. Thank you very much, Richard, and I cannot agree more on that. I'm conscious of the time, but I wouldn't like to end up, and I'm sorry uh, beforehand to all those that have posted questions and uh, that are, we're not going to be able to deal with them. Um, and, um, but it's, uh, you seem to be popular in Ireland, and you seem to have a lot of people that want uh, your professional services, uh, because there are several questions coming from Ireland about uh, many of the things that you have highlighted and looking for practical uh, advice on what they can do. And I'm going to take one from uh, Eugene Conlon, uh, who asked that in Ireland during a post the post-COVID situation, we see a significant move of people from what you refer as the creative class to certain regions, I suppose out of Dublin to the rest of the country, for quality of life and working environment benefits. Our community organization is one such areas. Uh, what specific actions, uh, Eugene asks, should we invest to create and nurture our environment and make it far more attractive and drive economic growth? And I suppose rather than having people going to, let's say, Galway or going somewhere else and staying in that community. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, this is a funny story. So I don't get to meet many rock stars. So one day in Toronto, I got invited to this hotel room in which Bono was there. And um, the guy who introduced me um, said, this is Richard Florida. And Bono said to me, you invented that Bohemian index and you showed it empirically. And that's what Dublin is about. So uh, look, I, I think that just tells you something about Ireland, that Bono was the one rock star who read my work, who understood what the Bohemian index was and had some sense that that was what gave Dublin vibrancy. It seems to me that Ireland and its small communities, as much as I know the country, have all of these attributes, all these attributes that we talked about, that Wojan talked about, that has these wonderful outlying communities where people would like to live. And I think in terms of building the spatial division of labor, you can promote that, but it's, it's not either or. It seems to me what Andres and I have been talking about is the connections between the rural hinterland and the superstar cities. So, so people may like to work remotely, or raise their families, but they also need connection to the urban hotspot. And thinking about that, I, I, this example of Prince Edward County that I mentioned several times here, always the economic developers there thought in terms of its connection to Toronto. It was never thought about as an isolated island. It was thought about as a dormitory community and now a workplace community related to Toronto. And I think that's the case with Ireland or the UK. I mean. Look, my, my, I'm, I'm Italian by origin. I could think of no better place to try to do this kind of thing than Italy as well. You know, Europe is, I've, I've often said that Europe is in, in better shape than the United States because it has these wonderful historic communities that have a history of arts and culture that have, you know, when I watch cycling races, it just all comes obvious to me. 
um, but which are suboptimized. So yeah, throughout Ireland and through Europe, there is the possibility of using remote work and, and rural growth. I just want to end on one thing for you guys to think about, and I'm happy to take a couple more questions, but I want to get this in here before we quit. One of the things I've been thinking about a lot is the role of land in economic development. And I don't want to end without this. And it seems to me that economists have really discounted the first classical factor of production, land, labor, and capital. If you look at the classical economists or Marx, they, they talk about the surplus. And, and if you read Marx, the surplus gets expropriated from the workers to the capitalists. But you know, I, I have read my Henry George and I want to write something on this. I've just been incredibly lazy post pandemic and enjoying the summer and traveling to Europe and kind of trying to get my life back. Um, Henry George said something quite provocative that the surplus, and I think this is even more true of the knowledge economy, it doesn't just go from labor to capital. In fact, there's a third class, which he called landlords. And his argument was the surplus in capitalism tended not that would, that which generated by labor and capital tended to flow to the landlords. I think it's quite interesting and almost paradoxical what's happened to land values and real estate costs. It's almost as if you could make the case, whether it's these rural boom towns or urban areas like London and New York, that that the surplus has just been plowed back into land values. That's not good. I don't know how to say that. If, if you're generating productivity, if you're being incredibly innovative, if you're increasing output, but all of that output nationally and locally is going right into increasing housing prices and real land costs. So it seems to me one of the things we have to grapple with is how do we deal with this? At, at a macro level, how do we deal with all the pressure that this productivity and innovation is putting on land values. And look, I think Andrew, she said, how's the US gonna deal with this? I think they're gonna induce a recession. I think we're looking at a pretty significant recession, interest rate hikes and trying to break this cycle. But that doesn't seem, because it creates tremendous volatility. It seems to be one of the things we should be thinking about as a team, as a group, is how do we deal with the fact that as we get productivity and new places come into the spatial division of labor, that that productivity is simply generated to increasing competition for land or real estate and increasing land values. Hey, I think we should, uh, I should now pass the baton to Claire Chappie, but before that, I'm going to take advantage of uh, my condition as this cousin to thank you wholeheartedly for your intervention. Uh, Richard, you never cease to amaze me. You may keep me on my toes and you always have uh, thought provoking uh, remarks. And I know how busy you are. So it's uh, really grateful. I would encourage everyone to give a virtual applause, but I think I'm going to leave that to Claire Chavit, uh, who is going to do the con concluding remarks. And Claire is the head of regional attractiveness and migrant integration unit at uh, the regional development and multi-level multi -level governance division of the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, regions, and cities. So Claire, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Uh, thank you, Richard, for this uh, high level debate. So, so we, it really brings us, uh, you know, into the future and reveals uh, what could be the key assets for regional development. It, it will definitely inspire our work. So we heard about, you know, it's quite challenging to <laughs> summarize. So we heard about the drivers to attract uh, um, creative talent in regions, including intermediary ones. And there is this question of, you know, the places that don't matter, as Andres uh, named them, and their, you know, room for manoeuvre in attracting creative talent and provide the good condition for them to progress. So um, we know that all regions are also impacted by uh, these, you know, four mega trends, uh, which are well underway, climate change, demographic change, digitalization, and globalization. So th this is a question of transition that we chart on the line uh, during his, his speech. So um, the COVID crisis, the, the first steps of the recovery, as well as the current uh, uh, Ukrainian tragedy, it, it has underlined the interdependence between these uh, global mega trends and the regional levels. And what we have noticed is, of course, the very asymmetric impact 
of all these uh, phenomena and the need uh, really to adopt some kind of territorial lens when dealing with this issue. Uh, so it has great consequences on uh, the geography of this content and Andres mentioned the case of my country in France uh, with recent uh, uh, election results, so we just can uh, witness it. So um, considering this uh, ongoing transition uh, and the need for regions to be prepared for the future, a key question is how to make region, all type of region, uh, attractive for the coming years. And you know we are working on the need to rethink regional attractiveness in the new global government, and we do this work with the support of the EU. So I will not detail, you have an access to our site and I invite you to, to visit it, but you know, from Europe to Latin America, what regions have told us to date is that attracting talent is really their priority. There is no possibility to attract investors, to attract visitors if you do not have uh, talent in, in your place. So uh, it's uh, of great importance. There is also this need to maintain some kind of diversity. And we, we heard about uh, today and tolerance, which you know sometimes diversity cannot lead to tolerance. So it's something which is quite important too. Um, it's important for the north of Sweden as well as the center of Portugal. So the question is not only to attract foreign talent uh, or make local talent to come back, the diaspora to come back, but also to retain them. And so um, th there is a key question, you know, the, the shift that uh, um, you need to attract and return talent to win or at least to survive. So it's something which is really important. And Richard, you just mentioned the land issue. Uh, it's really, you know, the availability of land is of course, uh, affordable land is of course something which is which is key. So uh, all uh, I, I will uh, not, um, you know, uh, enter into detail, just underline the fact that the quality of life uh, is key, the availability of land, the tolerance. So what does it mean for regional uh, development policy makers? It means a lot of change and a lot of evolution and the need to rethink uh, you know, regional attractiveness. That's the reason why we are developing a new methodology based on more than 50 uh, indicators to assess and compare and compare a regional profile uh, for attractiveness. And you know, uh, one key element is, of course, what do you do with all these drivers to build a regional ecosystem for attracting creative talent? Uh, for making these places resilient. So this notion of system, the multi-level governance, which is behind, is really key also. And combining cultural, natural amenities, uh, the quality of life are all the things we, we are exploring. So um, I just invite you to visit all the site and links which um, were provided uh, on the chat. But before closing, uh, I must thank uh, our head of division, you know, uh, Dorothée and Dupré for her support. And of course, my colleague, uh, Michael Flood and Peter Axton, as well as Nikki Trutt and Leslie Greenhow for their contribution to this work and specifically for making today's dialogue happen. Uh, we will have new dialogue on the future of region, you know, in the coming months to which you will, of course, be invited. But today, um, I want to thank you for your diverse uh, and active participation. You know, we received several questions and Richard kindly indicated that he will uh, deal with them uh, through email. So we will, you know, transfer and share uh, these questions and responses. So now let me offer our collective sense, you know, we cannot applaud or it's challenging uh, to Richard uh, uh, and of course to Andres for, for their time and their thoughtful contribution. So thank you very much and uh, I wish you a good uh, summer or a good winter for the other part of the, <laughs> of the hemisphere. Thank you, thank you very much, goodbye. <laughs>